Uh, today I'm going to talk about VR for games and kind of what works and what doesn't. I think we have a wide range of people here, so some of it might be a little bit review and some of it might be something you don't understand at all. But hopefully, if you have an interest in this, feel free to come up and talk to me about any of the things afterwards. We have a PlayStation VR coming out and uh, that's why we're all so excited about VR in our company. This is my office. It looks just like that. <laughs> um, it's called Magic Lab. What we really do is take technology and figure out how to create new experiences with new technologies, or even sometimes existing technologies that just nobody really ever thought of looking at those technologies through the lens of something like a PlayStation. So I have these two roles at PlayStation, really. I, I am a technology researcher, and I focus on interaction. But also, I am a technical PR person for our company, and I do, I'm a, kind of a product spokesperson for a lot of our things, especially the new, kind of more high-tech products. Similarly, on, on the VR side, I'm doing a lot of interaction research, but I'm also kind of one of our VR evangelists, so I go around and um, show things to a lot of people. So that, that kind of, and also, uh, that kind of creates a unique experience where I get to I've shown thousands of demos myself over the last couple of years. And also I've made things myself and I've tried everyone else's things. So I've got to see a lot of VR. And then I can also go back to the lab and, and you know whatever I've seen, I can get our guys to try to make better. So I try to compile all this knowledge and be able to share it with other people because otherwise it you know, doesn't get shared across the industry. So that's why I'm kind of here to, to give a talk about it. And uh, I, I always put the slide in my talk. It's this really great talk, uh, t TED Talk by Simon Sinek, if you want to see. It's about um, kind of a philosophy of how to make products, how to do research, and even how to live your life. Just focus on why you do things first. So why, I'm, why VR for games? Um, or why, why am I doing VR maybe is a better thing. Actually, because VR is really amazing. If you haven't gotten a chance to try it, please try to try it here if you get a chance. It's, uh, I didn't always... I didn't always think it was amazing. Oh, actually, I guess this didn't didn't start. But actually, when I when I didn't think it was amazing at first because it wasn't quite past the technology level. I, I I kind of felt like a screen in front of my face. And then once it crossed over that and it felt like I was someplace else, that feeling of presence. That's when it really changed. People don't know how to use VR completely yet, so it's a new area which makes me excited. And it's also very much about interaction, which is you know another reason. It's what I've been doing at PlayStation for 16 years. Sphere of VR Creator, I, the best recommendation I can give you, all this other stuff aside that I'm going to talk about, is just to try as many demos as you can and try to experiment. You might think something will work, but until you try it, it's hard to know that it'll work well in VR. Yeah, so those are the, there's the picture I wanted. <laughs> so um, before I go on, VR can mean a lot of things. It's a very broad term right now. It could mean 360 video, it could mean the glasses themselves. What I'm going to mean today when I say VR is this kind of ability to put you in an alternate universe when you have rendered, rendered imagery and uh, you have head position tr tracking and, and rotation tracking and also a significant amount of interaction capability. So that's kind of the definition I'm using today. So pretty much high quality VR is what I mean. Uh, I just came from a conference in Germany yesterday, actually. It's a special effects conference, and the new hot thing in, in Hollywood is, is VR as well. So how to tell stories in VR has had a lot of talks. I went there thinking I would be the only one talking about VR, and there was a, you know, four different talks about how to do stories and things in VR. And then there's some really great posts on, web, on the web and Medium about that if you have interest in telling stories in VR. I'm, I think we're more focused on games here, but VR can be can do a lot of different things. So rough outline of what I'm going to talk about is why is VR different? Um, and then a bunch of different techniques and things that work in, in VR. So I'm going to go into a deep dive about one particular game, the London Heist, which does a lot of things really well. And then um, I'll talk about some kind of random assortment of other things. So if, at the very beginning, it's a term that always gets brought up with VR is presence. That sense of feeling like you're somewhere else, that's the key to VR. That's what makes it different. You don't, you know, it's hard to describe if you haven't experienced it, but uh, it's really the key to VR. It's a disruptive feeling. There's no other real way to get that, and it changes things if you can achieve that. So 
because we, uh, and it's not just for games. That's why it's so interesting to so many other areas because once you feel like you're somewhere else, you can do a completely new set of things that you couldn't really do otherwise. Um, it's a new medium, it is different. That's why I'm gonna talk about how it's different. One of the key things about that makes it different is this feeling of presence matters more than whatever else you're trying to do, pretty much. If you mess with that feeling of presence, you no longer are in VR and then you're no longer you know, having a VR experience. So you really have to kind of stay true to the, the presence feeling. And also a lot of the things that, uh, that you, your art that looked good on your screen won't look good in VR. So, you, and you have to pretty much look at it in VR to know that. So it's, people ask what's the killer game for VR and actually kind of the killer meta thing is this feeling of presence. Actually, that's what makes it different than regular things. So you kind of have to just honor that. That's the, that's the fundamental reason we want to be in VR is to have this feeling of presence. What you can do with it is you can visit a place that doesn't even exist in the world. You know, a lot of times right now we're, we're drawing on these game worlds that we all know and love, or maybe worlds from movies. Those are the first places people want to go in VR, but eventually people will make stuff in VR. And those are these new worlds that people have already made in VR, I think is where we'll want to go. Can also go someplace real. We did some things with NASA where we just, it was a real simple brief, just feel like you're walking on Mars. So we worked with JPL and, uh, took real data that they had from the Mars rover and combined it into 3D uh, imagery. And then we also had the model, the animated model of the Mars rover, and it would roll right over to you and feel like it's right next to you. And then you could kind of move around and examine it and look under it. So it was a very simple scene, but a very powerful scene. Um, another very big difference about VR is that this kind of idea that it, you know, a regular traditional you know, movie or game is remote. You're seeing something and it's far away from you on a, on a screen. And VR is more like this. And now you can see why I'm not an artist because this is the capability I have for being art. So <laughs> I'll stay on the programming side of things. <laughs> but uh, what matters in, in VR, size and distance matter and they hardly matter at all on the screen. But in VR, they do matter. Something that's really big just inherently is kind of scary just by automatic automatically you can go past that if it you know acts real nice but the very first thing you're going to feel is big equals scary and small equals cute and less the little vorpal bunny you know, texture <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing is that um close me is important things that are close just inherently will feel important to you there's this uh example that the one of those citations i referenced um they did a study where they had this, it's this really kind of uh, very emotional experience where this person's thinking about committing suicide. It was a, a VR kind of story, but there's a cookie on the desk near the viewer and the people just can't focus on anything but the cookie. You know, <laughs> this person is sitting at the desk thinking about committing suicide and there's a cookie here and they just, they ask all these questions about the cookie afterwards after they did the experience, like why did they not eat the cookie? The cookie's not a part of the story, then you probably need to take the cookie out of the scene. Same for games. I mean, if you put things close to the person and they don't do anything, he's going to be very confused. So don't do that. Especially if it's within arm's reach because people are going to try to reach out and pick it up. There's a really great book about a lot of this psychology of these things called Infinite Reality. It's by some uh, researchers. And it, a lot of the same things that apply in regular psychology apply in VR. And it's a really easy read and kind of a very entertaining read. So I highly recommend that book. We have this experience called, um, uh, well, now it's called Playroom VR. And this is actually just the lobby experience of Playroom VR. It was one of our early demos. And you see all these little robots that are only about this tall. And you know they're this tall because in VR you can tell how big things are. And uh, they're cute because they're small. If they were 10 feet tall, they'd be scary, but they're cute. And you can kind of lean in and move around and get them, and they just feel really close. And everybody tries to pick one up. Every single person tries to pick one of those guys up. And of course, in that particular experience, you can't. And so you got to be careful. Like that, you know, it, it gives a sense of frustration sometimes when you can't. Another kind of powerful feeling is, is this. Uh, there's this uh, experience called summer lesson. So there's a kind of this virtual character, and she's you know, talking to you and things, and that's fine. But then she just comes over and sits next to you with a book, and she wants you to look at the book. And 
there's this weird, very strange moment when somebody crosses into your own personal space that it's hard to describe, and you have some kind of very instinctual reaction to that, and you're, you're like, ooh, I'm, you shouldn't be that close to me. I don't even know you yet. And that book I, I mentioned has a lot of things about about this, like if you know how well you know the person is how close you're willing to get, and people you know, all have different thresholds, but everybody has some kind of behavior like that. So that feeling, you can use it for good, like you can have a good feeling from it, but of course, in a kind of horror experience, it can be a very scary thing. So a very powerful uh, tool you have in VR is that how close you bring something. So if, you, if you've ever tried to show anybody your VR experience, a lot of this stuff doesn't come across. So there is this new thing that everyone's kind of figured out recently, which is uh, making a, a mixed reality video. This is, uh, we're not the only ones doing these kind of videos. Everyone is starting to do this for VR and gives you the feeling of that um, presence and kind of the nearness of it instead of that remoteness. So this is just the lobby part of it. And actually the lobby of this title is really cool. So that title is unique because it has five different, very different experiences on it. That, uh, and it's part of one of our pre-order bundle kind of packages thing. So um, I know that the, the mixed reality thing, if you haven't tried VR, a lot of people are like, oh, I can't believe it'd be like that. But if you had tried VR, you go, oh, yeah, it's kind of like that. So that's. <laughs> <laughs> so another thing about um, VR is it's very visceral and so a lot of times when you're playing a game you can kind of sit back and think about something but it's a lot different in VR you you have this fight or flight instinct that's hardwired into you and if something uh, threatens you if something in VR feels like it's gonna threaten you it's hard to think about anything else uh, it's like in, in things like bright colors or fast motion usually are threats or perceived as threats so Again, it can dis people can be heavily distracted by things, and uh, it's also kind of inversely related to distance again. So if it's close, it's more dangerous because it's close. For example, I'm, uh, you know, I wouldn't call it a phobia, but I'm a little bit afraid of birds because they move very fast and they, and they just make me nervous. So if there's a, <laughs> if there's a bird in, in the scene, I'm not going to be caring about much else at that moment. And uh, if it, there's this uh, experience, it's here in New York, if you've ever heard of it, it's um, Sleep No More, and it's an interactive theater experience. And a lot of things, things come, they come out when you go do it. It's, you know, when you're watching a play, you kind of abstract it away from you. But when you're standing next to the actors and they're doing it right next to you, and if one kind of moves past you, you for a minute start to worry about your own safety. Or if, you know, if somebody in that thing were to, up, were to pull out a gun or something, you'd suddenly like not be so worried about the, ver the, you know, the actor, you'd be more worried about yourself. And same thing in VR. So, uh, and then something like a phobia is just like a resonant frequency. Nothing else matters once a phobia kicks in. So if you're like afraid of a spider, for example, and this whole scene is really amazing, but there's a spider close to by you, you're just not gonna care about all the other amazing things happening. And there's all kinds of different phobias. And so a lot of people have various phobias. So you have to take that into account when you're making something. Imagine me, if you're afraid of being submerged and you're afraid of sharks, well, we have that experience that, you know, 
it's kind of like this. And, and so that, that's a very intense experience for some people. And for other people, not so much because they're not, they don't have that phobia. Fear of heights is the kind of a thing a lot of people share. And we made this experience called uh, The Walk. It's based on the movie The Walk that Sony Pictures made. And the whole idea of the experience was to let you feel like you're Philip Petit standing on the edge of the Twin Tower and, you know, having to step out onto the wire. And about half of the people that do this experience are unable to take one physical step. I mean, they just put the headset on not 30 seconds ago, and then they can't physically bring themselves to take a step forward. And there are some extra 4D effects in this one. We put a little wire on the ground, so when you reach your foot out, you feel that wire on the gr on, and you don't feel the ground. And, and, and that's usually when people say, nope, I can't do it. <laughs> Almost everyone will try to reach their foot, but a lot of, no, a lot, you know, half the people can't step forward. So, yeah, very powerful stuff. Another uh, experience we have that is kind of on the more horror side is this one called Rush of Blood. And it's, it's an on-rails kind of shooter. You have a, gu a gun on each hand, and you're going through this, well, it seemed like a haunted house at first. It becomes, you know, more than a haunted house as things start attacking you and stuff. But uh, I think what's interesting is it's scary enough that it's a haunted house, right? And you've been on haunted houses before. But this is a different thing because it's a video game. So you actually have control in this one. So you can do something. And that, that actually changes it. So my son fi found it more scary because he almost feels now responsible to, to to do something and like if, if you're in a passive experience you just say all right I can't do anything so whatever whatever happens happens but in this case you have what's called agency now so now you feel responsible if you happen something jumps out at you it's your job to stop it so it's, it's more intense and uh, this is kind of known by a few different people they've studied it and basically because you're present you feel like you should be active so if you do have these passive experiences it almost doesn't make sense when you're in VR because you feel this kind of inherent need to do something and then once you can do something it amplifies some emotions so fear like I mentioned but also guilt like if something happens and you don't do anything about it you get this really strong feeling of guilt and uh, if you do have agency and then it gets taken away from you then you can feel a really strong feeling of helplessness so that's another kind of dif difference from VR that you can't really do other ways. Um, just to be oh, kind of a special case, I talked a little bit about movies in VR and stories in VR, and, and that applies some of that to uh, cutscenes. I mean, cutscenes in VR are a little bit tricky anyways because you can't do some of the things, you, you can't really move the camera around the same way. You can't mess with the person's head. But, but you can influence what they're looking at, you can do things, so you can kind of change the scene and stuff, but you just can't physically move the camera the way you would in a normal cutscene. Um, but so all these things that the storytelling guys are working on, and they're working on it really hard right now, those will come over to gaming well, I think, for cutscenes. And I'm think, sure some of the gaming people will figure out things for cutscenes that they'll take from, they already are. So uh, yeah, so just know that there, a lot of that stuff, action is happening in other spaces too, not just in the gaming world. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to get now a little bit more into the more game specific stuff. Um, I, I've, I've given this kind of summary before about these different layers of presence. There's this kind of first layer, which is just, I hold something up to my eyes and it looks realistic. It looks believable. Then if I move my head around and it still stays believable, then that's kind of the next level of presence. You have all these little tests in your head that you do to say, is this real or not real? Um, and I feel that the position tracking is a big one. If, if you just do a little bit of position tracking and it doesn't do the right thing, you, then no. So it's hard to get presence without that. Different people have different amounts of how much it affects them, whether it motion parallax matters or kind of the lighting cues, things like that. Um, then a lot of times you look down at your own body and you look at your hands. And right now, most of the VR systems, you know, the high end ones have some kind of way to represent your hands, but pretty much not a way to represent your body realistically. So we still have some more work to do on that side of things for the future. Uh, another next layer is after I do something, what's the reaction? Is it, is it believable? It doesn't have to be realistic, but it has to be believable. And so if I set something over here and turn here, if I turn back, is it still there? Like those things are important. It's, and then there's this other kind of uh, presence, which is a little bit hard to explain, but if you're in the scene with me or a virtual characters in the scene with me, 
and they are referring to a virtual object as if it's real, then you start to believe it's real more too. So if we're just talking about this virtual thing together, it starts to become more real to us because we're both starting sharing this experience. And a virtual character character can do that for you too. If they're talking about this thing and holding it up, you believe it's more real. So it's kind of, and all those uh, last three are kind of on the interaction side, which is what I focus on mostly. So we're going to do a deep dive into this one experience called the London heist. This is our most intense experience. And uh, I'm just going to show a little clip from this. It's a very intense scene, this one. You and me are going to play a little game. And the game is called Red Serena. <laughs> I bet you thought you'd be halfway around the world by now. But you're here. This is 18 and up, by the way. I'm gonna bring you into cracks in a little piece of shit. I don't give a monkey's fuck what bad things about you. I don't trust you. And do you know why? Because there's only two people that could have taken Serena today. So, <laughs> so um, that that experience goes on, and uh, he gets a phone call. Luckily, and you know you're kind of saved by the phone call. And, and then he kind of hands the phone to you because he says the phone's for you. And so at first it's passive, but then it becomes active where you actually have to reach out and grab the phone and take it and then talk. And then you have a flashback and then there's a desk and you can explore the, with your hands the desk and look around and things. And then people come and you find a gun and then people start to shoot at you. So that gets more intense. So after the whole goal of it is to steal a diamond and it's you, so let's say you successfully steal the diamond well then the next experience kicks in where you're trying to get away and look you thought you think you got away fine so you're kind of just Keep your eyes now you're in a car obviously and it's in england so the driver's on the right So there, this has been one of our most successful and popular experiences, and it's for a lot of different reasons, and I'm going to go over some of those reasons now. But one of the reasons uh, that it's also been very interesting to people is because it is a little bit story-driven. So the people in Hollywood are equally interested to this as the game side of people. So um, there's a lot of fight or flight taking place in it. I mean, the guy picks up that blowtorch and immediately you have very little else in your world except for a blowtorch right that's the way it works and then when he when he stands up and jumps in your face again he got too close and that that's hard not to be focused on that um the game has very very simple controls it uses the move controller but it only uses the trigger for each hand there's no other controls that you need it actually does have some other controls and we've told people about those other controls but if you've never you know, done any VR or done anything, the extra controls actually are more of a distraction. And so we learned early on, don't tell people about the other buttons that basically don't, aren't needed for these experiences in this one. Um, that's a tricky thing, actually, because if you want to make a five-minute experience for people who haven't tried things before, it's a lot different than a, you know, something that somebody's owned for a long time. So you can maybe have levels of controls that you learn over the course of the game or something. That particular experience, it's, it gives you this time where you can kind of just get your bearings and observe, but then you get very busy later. So in both cases, you uh, get start getting shot at and you have to be, you know, kind of defend yourself. So when you're busy, you are, start to believe things again more real, are more real. So you stay present because you're busy. Uh, that, that car scene does a really good job, but everything that's within arm's reach is interactive. So you saw, people, you saw him open the door, the car door opens up. You saw him change the radio station and change the volume of the radio. Things that you think you should be able to do, it does pretty well. Uh, once you do pick up a gun and um, 
you can shoot their tires out of the cars the, the cars like flip over and explode and just like almost all video games kind of amplifying your input is always a great feeling in a in an experience the the one where you're being interrogated and the one where you're in the car are both in a seated situation and that feels really good it matches against what you're doing in the virtual space so having that kind of real world match of a, what your body feels like on your back and things works um it's not clear in that in the video and none of it is quite as good in the video you won't really understand how intense it is if you did it but when you move your head around the, the guy is actually procedurally animated to look at you so he he doesn't like look like he's locked on but he actually kind of like kind of casually adjusts his point of view so he doesn't because if he doesn't like if you go like this and he's still looking over here it's very you know that doesn't make sense he's not very smart anymore so you got to keep your characters smart you know, have to do some procedural animation uh uses spatialized audio really well so one of the really i'll, I'll talk about that more actually in a minute um and uh, uses two hands, and you didn't see it in this case, there was just the individual hand things being done, but in both of the experiences, when you find a gun, the way you load a gun is you have to use your other hand or in order to put the ammunition into it. And most people have never done a video game experience where they're you know, kind of doing this, what's called bimanual interaction. And so just doing that feels really good. We've done some like kind of pottery and, and painting things where you can hold an object and, and do it and other people, are, all this applies to other platforms too, not just PlayStation, by the way. So yeah, other, other people have done a lot with like Tilt Brush, for example, um, is a really good bimanual experience. And then uh, one of the other things that's done really well, and it's, and again, if you haven't tried it, it'll be hard to understand, but if there's like, the guy reaches out and he picks up the cup and the cup now gets locked to his hand. So the degrees of freedom of the cup are set to match the hand motion. But when he goes to change the radio, you can't like have the radio snap to your hand because the radio is fixed. So instead, your hand locks to the radio and your hand becomes locked to only the degrees of freedom that the radio has, so a, a single rotation in that point. And so always matching these kind of what the, thing can be, what the thing can do to what you should be allowed to do, it's this matching affordances is really important and it's, it's tricky because you, you, know, you think that you'd want to have free motion of your hand all the time, but you can't do that because it wouldn't match up with the environment. So I think when you're kind of in this grabbing state, then you match the environment and when you're released, it has to be a free hand. And then uh, another thing that happens in this experience, the last thing that I'm gonna talk about is the, this sense of object permanence and it does it better than any experience I've ever tried. First of all, in, the, in the, the one I was talking about, the desk scene, actually, when they start shooting, you, you hide behind the desk. And your life is kind of dependent on the bullets being stopped by the desk. And at that moment, you really, uh, you really start to believe the desk is there. To the point where we've had a lot of people, when they're hiding, they lean on the desk because they think the desk is there. Or they go to stand up and they lean on the desk. So you have to be a little bit careful of that. But... <laughs> But it, I mean, it just shows you how commit, kind of committed and almost all a whole large number of people set the controllers down on the desk at the end of the experience and, <laughs> and there's no desk. Um, uh, the driver, because he's, you know, you look over and you see the driver and you acknowledge his existence, but he also just keeps talking to you the whole time. And he's not even on screen. All the action's happening out front in that one, but he's talking the whole time. So you just keep believing that he's there the whole time. And he is, as far as you and if you look back over, of course, there he still is. But the last one, and the one I, I think is the most powerful me, for me, that when I watch somebody do it, I'm just amazed that this happens, is in, in that car experience, you end up finding ammunition to your right, off camera, kind of, you just got to look over there, and there's the ammunition. And then you get a gun, and it gets very intense, and you start reloading, and people reach over and grab some ammunition. And eventually, they just start grabbing over to the right without even looking, expecting that they're going to grab some ammunition and reloading the gun. And it does work. That works. And so people have just completely bought in that they're going to reach and look, do something they can't even see and then some action will occur that makes sense to them. And that's really, I think, powerful and we need to not lose that. that, that that's really, that really a big part of presence. So I already, met, I already talked a little bit about this uh, kind of real world affordance matching. Similarly, if you have a flying experience, if you could 
You don't have control over all these things always in a home environment. Some of this is a lot easier to do in a location-based environment if, you ha if you're doing with those. But if you could get the person's feet off the ground, flying feels much more realistic. Even if it's just seated on a, high, a little bit high of a chair and your, your feet are dangling, that's much more realistic. When you have a ground drawn in the scene, it's important that the ground matches the real world ground because you have a, a very strong sense of how tall you are if, if you're going to be doing anything. Unless you're intentionally, you know, moving away from the ground or something. If you could use the subwoofer in a room, you can add some extra real world vibration to match the virtual vibration that should be occurring. Um, one of the bad things, I was going to put a, I was going to put a smiley face on all the good things and a frowny face on all the bad things, but there's, there's a lot of good things and there's just be a lot of smiley faces in it. <laughs> so I, I put, I will put a frowny face here, but one of the things is when you reach your, vir your hand through a virtual object, you know, there's nothing we can do to stop your real world hand. So then you have a disconnect that's going to have to happen. Either you're going to have to stop the virtual hand and then it won't match your real world hand or you let it go through. And that doesn't make sense either. So this is a big decision that you have to do when you're designing your experience, what ma makes sense for your, for your experience. And it affects grabbing a lot because a lot of times when you go to grab something, you accidentally go through it. And so, um, and, and then if you have two players together, that's even more complicated because they can both move through each other. I mean, you can imagine two people going up and sticking their head right up against each other's head in the virtual space. I mean, you can't stop their head motion because then you'd be messing with the presence camera feel. So, yeah, there's not a great answer to that. Spatial audio, I, I said I was going to talk about. It's really important part of presence. Uh, we always focus on the visuals, but the audio in these experiences is another thing that's really changing it from what you see in a 2D experience on the screen to this kind of fully around you. You can use the audio to make somebody look in a certain direction. But again, if they're in this fight or flight, you can be having, oh, please look at me over here. But if they're, you know, there's a, if there's a bird right here, then you're not going to be able to look away. <laughs> so, um, but it is a good way to try to cue people and you can keep repeating the cue if they don't turn right away. Uh, it also is useful when you go to do something, if it clicks in the right place where you're doing it, it gives you that feedback a lot better than if it's just, just kind of ambient click. And then, uh, like I already mentioned with the driver, having things emitting sound that you're not even looking at, like kind of keeps them in your mind that they're still there happening. And it's, what's amazing is when it's spatialized, you can actually have lots of different audio streams coming at you and you have the ability to kind of separate them out. If you just did that in 2D, it'd be a mess of audio and you wouldn't be able to know what's going on. But in, in 3D, you can do it really well. Same, same for visuals, actually. A lot of times when you take a game and just draw it in VR, it suddenly looks kind of sparse. There's not very much stuff because, you know, you add that third dimension and it all feels a lot bigger. And uh, uh, one of the things that happens, I mentioned, is the guy hands you a, a phone and then you take the phone and there's actually audio coming out of the phone. You hold it up to your ear and it sounds like it's coming and you can switch ears and I mean, it just moves around. And having anything that emits audio that's in your hand and you can move it around is just really fun, actually. Maybe we'll get tired of that in you know, a year or so, but right now it's just like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so procedural animation, actually that, that particular experience you just saw the hands of you. you there's no body to you and everyone's like that's weird and it looks really weird on the tv to some people but actually in vr when you do it after a while you just don't spend a lot of time looking at your own arms and body you really don't and you really do look at your hands a lot and so the focus just goes onto your hands and you don't even notice that there's no arm there once you're in vr and uh however if you're going to do something with a multiplayer experience you know, then hands floating look like disembodied hands. And you can still get the kind of kind of humanness of the, the hands when they move, but it doesn't f quite look like a human. So we've tried to do things where we render uh, a different, well, let's just, I'll just run this video. So this is a third person view of myself. So you can see, and actually it's kind of interesting to see yourself in third person and and you can see, so we're just taking the head and the hands and mapping them onto the, the IK kind of solution for this figure. And since we know that you can't walk around, we don't enable walking around in our experiences, then we know the feet of the character are going to be fixed, then it, you can actually do quite a bit of animation knowing that kind of anchored spot. And it's going to switch to first person, so then you can see there's not a lot more than your hands that are ever on 
in view anyways. And so that's a multiplayer kind of disc throwing experience. Um, also, the having a other the NPC, like I said, that guy tracks you around, and that, that's procedural. But you can also have the characters point and do things like that, and they could adjust and, and, and like the object permanence. I mean, if there's a virtual object and the guy's going like that, tracking it, this NPC, in 2D, it's a little bit hard to see where somebody's pointing, but in 3D, in VR, you can really see that his pointing matches up and it all makes sense. And when it doesn't match, it doesn't look right. So you have to do those things correctly. And the eyes also are really key in VR. If you, if you have the uh, non-player character's eyes do the right thing, it, it's, it looks a lot more believable. Uh, okay, and one more thing is we did this work with NASA controlling a robot on the International Space Station and they had an IK solver already and the robot can't move its base but it can move its arms and, it, and so we mapped the move controllers to drive the IK system but what happens is the robot has limits of its joint angles and things but you don't have the same limits as a human so you know when you go to move the robot just stops and it's very, actually very frustrating that it won't just do what you want to do. And everyone just thought the move tracking was broken, like it, it's not tracking the controller right. So we had to actually draw little ghost controllers in so people would realize, oh, it is still tracking, but the robot is now stopped. So that's a kind of way you can kind of separate out things is, is show that when the, when the IK character's motion can't follow where the controller is, you can then start to draw a ghost or something. That's one, that's one thing you could do. One of the things we experiment is stretching the character a little bit. Actually, stretching a little bit is works okay too. So, VR is kind of like the ultimate sandbox. Actually, one of the things that we've got wrapped up in is you can just take um, a physics world and put a person in VR with it, and they can just throw objects, and that's very entertaining. It is like a giant toy box, and and. Um, we, we have some really good physics simulations where you can just pick things up, put them in cupboards, open drawers. And it's, that doesn't sound like a game. It sounds like a very boring uh, experience, but it actually, you know, it's easy to stay in those experiences for quite a while. And you can imagine if you then also have magic powers and superpowers, then it gets even more fun. So combining that, and there's some really great experiences that people have been making. It feels amazing to have those superpowers in this kind of sandbox environment all kinds of things that you could want to do probably and you, you we do in games already all the time so doing them in VR makes a lot of sense flying and teleporting I'll talk about those more later kind of having uh, this ability to pick things up and and use the force or something is really awesome Just growing objects or yourself shrinking and growing both directions are really cool to do in VR and actually one of the, my favorite kinds of VR is like what's called sometimes tabletop VR or something where you can take a whole world and shrink it down into this space in front of you and then you can move around and look at it and it just feels like it's a whole little world shrunk down and you can imagine something like a, a soccer game a really you know very realistic soccer game but you shrink it down to like this and you play using a controller and you, you know you could see the character run around on the soccer field so I, those, it's really amazing when things get shrunk, how good they look too, because of course, you know, you take the art that was designed for a large experience and shrink it down, it looks very, very detailed, just like little figurines look very detailed. And uh, pretty much any particle effect shooting out of your hands is amazing. So, <laughs> you know, fireball is kind of the first thing everyone wants to do, but anything that shoots out of your hands is awesome. And that one you could do for, again, a long time. There's a, Great talk by uh, the bullet train designers that was at GDC, and it's online. The whole talk is online. Um, so I recommend looking at that. But they talk a lot about teleportation and how they did it. And for many people I know, the best VR experience they've ever had is in bullet train. And part of it has to do with teleportation. Another part of it has to do with uh, the other parts of it. But So one of the things they talk about is using the force to pick objects up and, it, and how you do that. You'd think you would just, I mean, nobody really wants to have a, like a, a pointer shooting out because it kind of breaks the experience there, or they didn't because it breaks the experience. So instead, they just try to make it so you could just reach your hand out and it would pick up the right thing. But then you don't actually have the force, right? You've never done it that way. So what should happen? Where should it get stuff from? If there's a clutter of objects, which objects it's going to, how is it going to pick up the right object? And they did a study and different things. And so if they just did the vector from your eye to your hand, that seemed like a good one, but that wasn't quite right. And then they just tried a vector out of your hand to the right thing, but that's not quite right because people kept trying to pick things up 
doing it the opposite. So they did this kind of hybrid approach with their pretty, which they got pretty happy with, which is you have a, a vector from here to your hand and then a mini vector out of your hand. So you kind of have this like extra kind of influence. And that, that makes sense because you have like a wrist and you have a long arm and you're kind of used to doing that to pick things up. So I think it has some physical basis, but yeah, it's really cool. So the part that they really liked for teleportation, a lot of people, is that you can be in a place, throw an object, teleport to the other side, and then catch the only object that you threw, right? So there's a lot of uh, videos online, actually, of people like, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be here and they want to kill a guy over there, so they throw a gun up in the air, they go over, they catch the gun, and they shoot the guy. <laughs> so um, not as good as our ninja moves up here, but yeah. Uh, uh, this is a little bit abstract, but uh, w when you say these controllers, like hand controllers, people say motion controls, and they think of the Wii maybe. But a different way to think about them is actually we have button presses, and we just need context for what the buttons should do. Like think of the buttons as your actions you want to do in an experience, and you need some context. And spatially where your hand is is a pretty good bit of context. So selecting something, like I just said, actually picking something up with a force, it's almost more like it's the context. It's not exactly where my hand is, but it adds some reference to my grab operation. It doesn't always work that you can think of it this way, but it's just a, a different way to put your mindset on when you're thinking about what this means and what, how to interact with things. Uh, we have a few experiences that render the controller. Sometimes you can do it literally. It's a whole part of the experience, like with the the Japan studio made this magic controller experience where robots come flying out of the controller and it's kind of similar to the playroom um, experience that's in comes with every PlayStation 4. But then uh, Super Hypercube, which we're showing here today, um, that one actually just, you can look down at it, you see a stylized representation of the controller, which matches the art style of the game. And then it shows you what the different buttons do. And when you press one, it shows it. And that's good for the initial bit of learning what how to play the game. And then you never look at it again after that, which is okay. But it's there. If you ever need to, you can look back down at it. The controller can actually give you a kind of a grounding, a connection to the world. So it's nice at the beginning, especially. And then you can rumble the controller to get you to look at it if you needed to look at it for something. So it can say, you know, this is the button you should be pressing. Because, I mean, to be honest, you won't look at the controller a lot when you're playing if you know all the buttons already. But I guess in real games, people are used to looking down at the controller whenever they want, and so you can leave that in as part of the experience if you'd like. So locomotion in VR, I'm almost done, by the way. Locomotion in VR is one of the um, hottest topics, and it's it's a very controversial topic because uh, what a lot of people think that we need to just figure out how to walk in VR. That's the goal. And I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum, and I think I am on the furthest end of the spectrum from everyone else probably. But... My feeling is that, um, well, so in, in movies, you watch it, a superhero has this power and he does it. And he usually does it once and then he stops doing it because it's such a foreign thing to us that we, if he did that the whole movie, we, none of us would relate to him anymore. And it would you know, be hard to write a plot line for that because, uh, yeah, if you could teleport anywhere you want. There is one movie where characters making a peanut butter jelly sandwich and he just keeps teleporting to the refrigerator and teleporting back to the counter and... Who wouldn't do that if that's what you could do? I mean, why would you not do that? And that's how, what I believe. Once we have these powers, when would we not use these powers? And so right now they feel foreign to us and they, we don't understand them and they don't feel part of a narrative that we, we could ever construct. But once we've done it for a year, and like the bullet train example I'm saying, once people figured out, or if you played Portal, after you've portaled, you don't walk. You could just portal over there. You'll never do that again. And so... I think that's going to be, and I think this is a really rapidly evolving space as more people try. Um, if you do um, different kinds of locomotion, having a fixed context helps. So if you have like a cockpit or maybe like a, the console of a car, that helps when you want to do motion. Um, the, I mean, the issue is that your real body is not moving through space, but visually you're seeing things move through space. And a lot of times it is the, the, the things on the periphery that are the biggest issue. So if you add a environment on the periphery that's fixed in the real world, it helps. One of the things we've experimented a lot with is the idea of just grabbing the world and moving the world to you. And that seems weird, but what happens is 
the world locks to where your hand is and you're, you're expecting your hand to do this and just the world just comes with it and your attention again is focused on your hand and everything just kind of works and makes sense. So you can actually just swim through the world like this, just grabbing the world in there and just move through. Um, you can grab the world and stretch the world like this and then you can scale it up or scale it down. Or So instead of thinking of moving yourself, you could just kind of think of the other way, I'm moving the world to me. You can do things with little mini teleports that works really well and, and doesn't um, make most people feel anything weird. You can just you know jump a little bit of distance forward, or you can jump a little bit of dis or a little bit of rotation. And instead of doing this kind of continuous thing, these jumps are confusing to our brain and they they don't trigger a lot of the uh, automatic reaction that your brain might have in a negative way. So. Flying is one of the ones I like the most, and I, again, if I could fly, what? And I, I mean, in, in movies, Superman could fly, right? But he flies when he needs to fly, but then all the other times he walks around. And in the comics, actually, he's often just kind of hovering, like just, and that, that's what he would really do. Like, when would he ever touch down? He would just, just flit around. And so I've, I've done a lot, I've done some experiments recently with flying around, and I, I, I'm starting to get worried because I've done a lot of ER now, and I can fly a lot. I like to fly. And, and uh, I don't know if that will translate to anyone who's trying it for the first time. I did uh, one recently with a broom and the broom was quite neat because the broom is actually what's flying me around. And so I manipulate the broom and I think, again, my focus is on the broom and then the broom travels me through the world. And I think that makes sense again. It, it's like, how should I fly? I don't really have any like idea of what I should do to fly, but the broom flying does kind of make sense. If I push it forward, then it then I go forward, and if I pull it back, it's kind of like a horse, I guess. You can use other objects that you maybe would hold out, and it would pull you along. Uh, some things that, um, a little bit different topic, uh, when one person's in VR and other people are not in VR, that can work really well. Jesse Shell has this prediction that there will be an asymmetric party game in the top 10. Well, since it's bundled with every PlayStation VR, I'm pretty sure that he's right, that there will be a top 10 game. I mean, it's like saying Wii Sports is going to be, you know, one of the top Wii games. I mean, <laughs> yes, it's, everyone gets it. Um, but yeah, so the people on the couch can have a controller. Or, uh, I actually get, get the visual for a minute, and then I'll go into the. So it could be that every single different player has a controller, but one person is in VR. Could be that the VR person has a controller and everyone else doesn't. And that's neat because actually then you can have an infinite number of players. We have one experience where the person in VR has to do things and everyone else sees a different image on the screen and they call out stuff to the VR person. And so they have to kind of like uh, take that into account. And so we have lots of people yelling things at you and that makes for a good party game. Um, you can also, um, this hasn't been done by anyone that I know of yet, but the people who are not in VR can have these controllers that are tracked, and they could move objects around in the VR person's world. And I, I think I encourage somebody to play with that because I really think it would be neat if you could move around. Um, you could actually like draw paths of things that are going to happen in that person's world, and they don't necessarily happen right when you do it, but they happen later. There's different things you could do with that. And then audio is, a, is again, like having the person Maybe they don't need to wear the headphones during these experiences if they want to interact with the people around them. Our, one of our the Playroom VR experiences, when the person in VR talks, it uses the microphone and that gets morphed and, and comes out through the speakers of your TV and to a really funny sounding voice. So whenever you're talking to the person in VR, they have a really funny sounding voice because it's coming through the TV weird. So I think there's neat things you can do with the microphone and audio. And the final thing, just a... And I don't have enough time to just go into this because this is a whole topic by itself is being present somewhere else with another person is is probably the killer app of VR. If it's, I mean, if you have to pick one, it just again, it doesn't define any genre, but just being there with somebody else and, and doing stuff together is really, really awesome. And there's not very many experiences like this yet, but there will be. And um, some of the key things that help is if, if you have ability to talk to them and then their audio is spatialized so that it feels like they're where they are, it's kind of a no-brainer that you would want that and, and it, it is really strong feeling. Also, though, once you have that, like this voice chat, so we did this robot experience I mentioned with, with uh, NASA and, and we had two robots facing each other that have to cooperate to do something. And we were showing it always to somebody who'd never tried it before. And then we'd have one of us in there. And so we'd have to tell them what we're supposed to be doing. And you're trying to describe it with words. And you say, pick that object up. 
Well, if you just say pick that object up, they have no idea what you mean. But since you have hands and you can point and say pick that object up, then they immediately know what you're talking about. So again, adding that context with your hand is huge, even just for communication. So there's different, you don't have to have hands to point. You could have a controller that gives you some ability to point, but having the ability to point and point things out to players, I think, other players. And then physics with other players is awesome. We showed this kind of tech demo social experience where you can just do all this wacky stuff in, again, it's like a big playground. And there's a trampoline in one place. And so one guy was bouncing on a trampoline and the other guy comes and he jumps on the trampoline and launches that guy just like a real trampoline. I mean, the things that you could do in physics with two people, it just is really fun. And again, the physics, they have to be believable, but not exactly the real world physics. So you can always make things kind of hyper real. And that's a lot of different things. I know I tried to squeeze it all into one talk, but uh, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>